Thank you very much. In case you didn't have enough provocation uh, yet, I am happy to be able to supply some more. Now, the main topic, the main topic, I think, that we have to deal with when we address education, especially of young people, of course, is the question of the relevance of the topic to their lives. And let me start by being rather practical or trying to be rather practical. Because in actual fact, it's almost impossible to teach the subject. You've got so many hours, whether it's two or four or six or eight or 10 or 12. In addition, you have a number of other topics that you have to deal with. You are a half psychologist as a teacher in school. You have a tremendous load upon you. It's impossible really to become an expert on any of the topics that you deal with. So that's one thing. There is a question of how the wisdom, yes or no, of the historians and sociologists and all the other academics that deal with it, how it percolates down to the teachers and from the teachers to the students. How does one do that? How does one teach this almost impossible topic? Uh, then there's the environment. There are different countries, different civilizations, different cultures, different backgrounds even within one country in different areas. There are different social strata. There are different religious belief systems or no belief systems. How do you deal with that? And then of course, whatever society it is that you teach in, none will come clean as far as this topic is concerned. Wherever you teach, whether it's America or Britain or Germany or Poland or Italy or Spain or Argentina or Asia or Africa, nobody comes clean, not even the Jews. I'll give you some examples. The, immediately upon the conquest of Kaunas in uh, Lithuania, a temporary Lithuanian government was established. It uh, was responsible for Lithuania under German rule for about one month, six weeks. And then the Germans decided they didn't want any kind of autonomy or independence of Lithuania, so they abolished it. But during that period of time, they were very influential. The head of that government was a professor of literature at Kaunas University, Jozas Ambrasevicius. Now, under his control, this government established the first concentration camp in Lithuania for Jews on Fort Seven, outside of Kaunas. And then they passed a Jew law, which was modeled on the uh, 19, September 1935 Nazi party resolutions. And then, of course, the thing was abolished. Professor Ambrasevicius then became a helper of the German government in Lithuania. But he distanced himself from it because it was clear as time went along that Germany might lose the war and then that it will lose the war. So there was an underground organization. The Germans had full knowledge of everything that was happening there, of course. They didn't do anything, but they talked. And they hoped for an alliance between the Western powers Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union. Professor Ambrasevicius then fled with the German army to Germany. From there he made it to the United States where he died in ripe old age. 
And now, just recently, they wanted various political bodies in Lithuania wanted to rebury the man with great honors and established statues and whatever. The uh, University of Vilnius opposed it, but it didn't, happen, didn't, didn't make any difference. Now, there are uh, academics in Lithuania who oppose all this very much, but there's an internal fight there. And there are large segments of the society that don't want to recognize the fact that the vast majority of Lithuanian Jews were actually murdered by Lithuanians under German command. But that's just one example. How did the Greek collaborationist mayor of Thessaloniki act when the Nazis came to concentrate the Jews and finally deport them. What did the Greek population in Thessaloniki do? Well, they wanted to get hold of Jewish property and of the Jewish cemetery, which is very good land. Did anyone in Greece examine that in detail? I'm not aware of that. The central religious authorities in Athens tried to rescue Jews. The bishop in Thessaloniki did the opposite. You don't come clean anywhere. In Bulgaria, even in Denmark, you don't come clean. Hungary, there's a rise of nationalism. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you don't commemorate the Holocaust. Oh, well, yes, you do. It's a good thing to do because it's very sort of accepted in the world. It's a bon ton to commemorate dead Jews. It's much more difficult to deal with the live ones or with the true history that you have in your own country. One can go Country after country, America, Britain, the Scandinavian countries, the West European countries. And in the Warsaw Ghetto, there was a group of Jews that wanted to collaborate with the Nazis, the Trinatska, the 13. It's very, very difficult. And the question that I'm asking is how come that this central event became a cultural icon all over the world, not just in Europe, not just in the United States, Canada, Argentina, and some other places. There are four universities in China that are teaching the Holocaust. There are two memorials in Japan about the Holocaust. There is now, at this moment, being created a Holocaust museum in Dakar in Senegal. There are museums being established in South Africa, in various places in the world. Now, what does that actually mean? What does it mean for education? Because is this Honest and serious, in many cases it is. In some cases, it is a cover for trivialization of the Holocaust. Because then you can say, we've done Holocaust. We've put a V on that. We've done what we were supposed to do, and now we can move on. That's not what we are about in Holocaust education. That's almost the opposite. My colleague, Professor Dan Diener of Hebrew University and Leipzig University in Germany coined the German concept of Zivilisationsbruch, civilizational break or break in civilization. I'm not sure he's right because there are civilizations outside of Europe where this 
is not something that they are immediately or should be immediately concerned with, but they are concerned with it. Why? I think, and this is just a conjecture on my part, I can't prove it, that there is a dim realization in the society, in the culture, and amongst politicians as a result of that, that indeed something happened there that was, as I put it in some of my work, unprecedented. It happened at the center of European civilization. And yet, it's not, it doesn't concern only Europe. It concerns the whole world. And then, of course, the fact that this particular group of victims, the Jews, are the fonts et origo, the foundation and the origin of the belief systems of Christianity and Islam, and that's more or less, well, over half of humanity. And this happened to them. There is my view that you have to compare the Holocaust with other genocides. You must, because if you want to show that the Holocaust is indeed unprecedented, you can only do that by comparison with other genocides. And the Holocaust was a genocide. The Holocaust, of course, the term we all know is the wrong term for what happened. It was a genocide of the Jewish people. I would argue that the Holocaust was the most extreme form of genocide, not because of the suffering of the victims. There's no difference there between Jews and Tutsi and whoever. In any situation of mass murder, mass violence, genocidal massacres, whatever, the suffering cannot be measured. There's no scala of suffering. There's no better genocide than another genocide. No better killing of children than other killing of children. No way. There's a clear parallel between the Holocaust and other genocides. It's not the numbers. According to estimates that I accept, 5.7 million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. And if it was 5.6 or 5.8, does it make any difference, except, for the vic except to the victims and their families? And the percentage of Jews who were murdered relative to the total number of Jews then in the world is about one third. A higher percentage of Armenians were murdered in the Armenian genocide. A higher percentage of Tutsi were murdered in Rwanda. And nobody has yet found out what a proportion of the Fur and Masalit and uh, Zarawa and Darfur, the victims there in proportion to the others. No, it's not the proportions. It's not the numbers. It's not the suffering. It's other elements. There was a, an industrial murder which was not pre-planned, but there was an ideology out of which this came naturally as things developed. And uh, what happened then was that the Nazis decided, as we all know, as you all know, that every Jew, literally every Jew, everywhere under the sun was to be annihilated. And the ideology behind it was totally unpragmatic. It was delusionary. The Jews did not even have a political organ to represent them, not in Germany and not anywhere else. 
it wasn't until 1936 that the World Jewish Congress arose because of the challenge of Nazi Germany. And it wasn't very effective. And the first time that there was a actually a political organization of German Jews, not all German Jews because Jews never can agree with each other, in September 1933, eight months after Hitler came to power, not before that, in response to the rise of the Nazis to power. The Nazis and their collaborators all over Europe killed the people who worked for them. Contrary to what our colleague Baumann says in his work, this was not modern, nor was it pre-modern. It was something outside of these concepts. Because to kill your own workers, whom you need to produce arms, or accessories to your armed forces, is anti-capitalistic. It goes against the grain of any kind of pragmatic consideration. There's no precedent for that in human history. You know, look at genocide as a dark landscape, black landscape. And out of that arises a volcano, a black volcano spewing fire. It belongs to the general landscape, but it sticks out as an extreme case in that landscape. So you see, I think that that is, those are some of the reasons why it becomes a cultural code. Or as our colleague in Tel Aviv, Shulamit Volkov, put it, a cultural icon. And rightly so. If you want to fight genocide, you start with the most extreme case, with the Holocaust. And then you can understand what the other genocides are about. So, how do you deal with that? But well, the natural response to that is trivialization. Because it's so difficult a subject. Because it's death and horror. And so, I'll give you an example. The most widely read book about the Holocaust is the Anne Frank Diary, is it not? The Anne Frank Diary is not about the Holocaust. It's the diary of a 12, 13 year old girl who is in hiding and it deals with her experiences as a 12, 13 year old girl, her relationships with her parents, her brother, first love. She hears about things outside. She reflects on them very briefly. The diary is not about that. You know, if you want to trivialize the Holocaust, use Anne Frank diary. Now, uh, this is not what most people think. But I didn't promise you to talk about things that people agree on. <laughs> now, had she survived, they were, as you all know, found out, shipped to Auschwitz, and Anne Frank landed in Bergen-Belsen where she died of typhoid a few 
weeks, couple of weeks, three weeks before the liberation. Now, had she survived and had she continued her diary, that would have been a diary about the Holocaust. But she didn't survive and she didn't write. So this is the wrong way to approach the subject. And there are other forms of trivialization all over the place, and understandably so, as I said, because it's so difficult to deal with. Another way, and this is very complicated, and you have to deal with it as educators, are the righteous, not only the non-Jews who rescue Jews, the Jews who rescue Jews as well. There are exceptions. They have to be exceptions. They are heroes, there's no doubt about that. And had it not been for the righteous or the rescuers, we wouldn't be able to teach the Holocaust at all. Because you can't face young people with horror and darkness only. Can't be done. And rightly, very rightly, you use the stories of the righteous, the rescue, the escape. If you emphasize that these are exceptions, you're doing the right thing, I think. If you don't emphasize that these are exceptions, which makes them even more heroic than they would be in any case, if you don't emphasize that, you're not doing the right thing, I think. Now, last night, we had a tremendous experience, in my view at least, of a wonderful singer, my humble opinion, one of the two great singers that we have, the other one is Achino Amnini. And she sang the songs that we all heard. And you know, as I was listening to her, I was certain the next song would be Ponar. Now you know what Ponar was, of course. In Polish, Ponari. In Lithuanian, Paneriai, that is outside of Vilna, Vilnius, where tens of thousands of Jews were murdered. It's a song that everyone, at almost every occasion of a commemoration of the Holocaust in this country, is sung. And rightly so, it's a wonderful, haunting melody. It comes from the Vilna ghetto, just like the partisan song comes from there. And uh, the original words were lost. And then uh, upon the liberation of Vilnius, out of the forest emerged the great poet of the Vilna ghetto, Schmerke Kaczerginski, who was a partisan fighting the Nazis and their collaborators in the Rudniki forest. When Kaczerginski came back to Vilna, he found this song, people sang it. And he wrote new words to it, and those are the words that we use today. And the beginning, the first words are, silence, silence, here grow graves, like trees or flowers. But instead of trees growing or flowers growing, graves are growing in Ponar. Who wrote the melody? Who composed the melody? Kaczerginski found out, and there were others who knew. An 11, 12-year-old boy in a competition music competition for children that took place in early 1943 in the Vilna ghetto. He won the first prize, and that is the melody. Who was that boy? 
Well, Kaczerginski found out that the name of that boy was Volkovisky. What happened to him, he didn't know. Nobody knew. A few days ago, Stephen Smith was here, and a few others, and myself, went to a concert just across the valley here in, in Karin, in a music center, the Eden Tamir Musical Center. I know that place very well because my brother-in-law, who is a cellist, appears there quite often. And we went to a uh, piano recital. Now, it's called Eden Tamir because Alexander Tamir, the pianist, had a partner, Bracha Eden, who died some years ago, but he kept the name, the Eden Tamir Musical Center. He's been at it for the last 50 years or so. And you know, when you go to these concerts, uh, not the one we went to last Friday, but the normal concert, uh, there is, of course, uh, the concert. And then in the interval, you get hot soup, which is very useful in Jerusalem in the winter. And the soup is cooked by Alexander Tamir himself, and he's the one with a ladle who hands out, ladles out the soup. Alexander Tamir is a Holocaust survivor. He never denied that, but when he came to Palestine, before the establishment of the state, he came as Alexander Tamir. And he said, I'm a survivor, I come from Poland, and I don't want to talk about it. And that was it. He never did. He's a great musician, a composer, a pianist. And there was a young researcher, and she went and tried to find out what happened to Volkowski and what his real name was. And she found out that the first name of Volkovsky was Alec. And then she narrowed her search more and more, and then she faced Alexander Tamir one day. And she said, are you Alec Volkovsky? And he said, yes. So why did you say so? He said, I didn't want to. I had no reason to do so. This is past history. I lost all my family. I don't want to remember this. But you wrote Ponar. He said, so what? I wrote other things as well. But this is the great song in Israel about the Holocaust. He said, well, there are other songs too. Alexander Tamir is Alec Volkovsky. Why did I tell you the story, this story? I was a little bit inspired yesterday by Dorit telling the story, which is also about Vilna, which is in a way parallel. Because Alexander Tamir's parents, his father was a doctor, born in Vilnius, Vilna, moved to Warsaw, and then when the war broke out, they became refugees in Vilnius again. They died, all of them, the whole family. You see, there is a song. There are the words. Silence, silence, here grow graves. Who wrote the words? A Jewish partisan, a poet partisan. Who wrote the melody? A child, a boy. He wrote the melody about the extermination place outside Vilnius. And he survived, one of the few who, who did, and he wanted to forget. But he couldn't. It came back. He had no choice. The man speaks truth. 
he was raised like that. And when the young woman confronted him, he said, yes, that's me. No denial. If you tell that story at the beginning of your lesson about the Holocaust in a school, that story or the possibility of hundreds and thousands of other stories, then you're doing the right thing, I think. Now, of course, you will immediately say, yes, but the Holocaust survivors are dying out. What will, shall we do after that? There are tens of thousands of video testimonies. In the Shoah Foundation in Los Angeles, at Yad Vashem, in Memorial de la Shoah, in, all, in, in Washington, all kinds of places. Not only video, audio, stories, testimonies. Then there are, you see, slogans, cliches. Please don't use them. Never again is such a cliche. I shudder when I hear that. Because, of course, it's ever again, not never again. You hide behind a cliche like that. We shall never forget any first year student of psychology will tell you that if somebody constantly repeats, I will never forget, he's dying to forget, but he can't. It's coming back to him. Do Jews want to remember the Holocaust? They don't want to. They have to. But if the Jews forget the Holocaust, the non-Jews will remind them of it. Now, there are ways, you see, that you can try to overcome these tremendous difficulties and challenges. I don't know whether they'll work or whether they work now. I'm not talking about Jewish society now, which is a traumatized society, understandably so, in Israel and abroad. Because when you lose one third of your community, then obviously you are in a constant trauma. So in Israel, you drive on the road and see somebody being stopped by a traffic policeman for speeding and the driver gets out of the car and starts yelling at the policeman, Gestapo, Nazi! In the Knesset, constantly, you find the use, misuse of Holocaust verbiage everywhere. And it's not only politicians, it's the ordinary people. What can you do about it? What you do with trauma generally. You act so that the person, in this case a community, will face the reality of what really happened. This is what we heard this morning from Michael Maris. Get it right. Can you get it right? After all, the historians don't agree with each other. The sociologists, people in literature, theology, whatever. They don't agree with each other. You are just a teacher in a high school in I don't know where. How are you going to find out who is right? Yes, an academic has an obligation to do so as far as she or he can. But a teacher in a school, what do you expect her or him to do? To be a judge between different academic interpretations. It's very, very difficult. So what do you do? Well, the obvious answer that I have is I don't know, clearly. But that's not 
You know, when you come as a so-called expert on Holocaust studies, you're expected to give some answers. So I'll try to give some very unsatisfactory answers. First of all, what don't you do? You don't start with human rights. Because human rights, the denial of human rights to Jews, did in fact precede the Holocaust. And you could argue that that was one of the steps that led up to the Holocaust. But the denial of human rights to German Jews was the denial of rights to German Jews. And until June 1939, the British and the French were negotiating with the Soviets about a military pact against Nazi Germany. June 1939, when that broke down, Stalin made his pact with Hitler. And uh, had that come off, there would have been a different war maybe, or no war, no war, no Holocaust. Different war, I don't know. But it's not only June 1939, September 1938, when the uh, 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 West yielded to Germany to dismantle Czechoslovakia. The French and the Czechoslovaks had a military alliance. Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union had a military alliance. France and the Soviet Union had a military alliance. It was the British who put a spanner in the works there. But the leadership of the Wehrmacht, of the German army, was scared that there would be an, an alliance like in World War I. They would lose the war. And so the chief of staff of the Wehrmacht, of, well, of the Reichswehr at that point. Ludwig Beck resigned in August 38 because he didn't want to enter into a war against this alliance. They sent high officers and civilians to Britain, to Sweden, and to France to tell them that they were preparing a putsch against Hitler. was led by some of the people who would reappear in July 1944 as uh, the conspiracy against Hitler. And, uh, of course, the British yielded. Chamberlain, we all know that. And you don't make a push against a successful politician who prevented a war, right? by making that agreement at Munich. But the German army didn't want a war. Or at least the top leadership of the, Brit of the German army. At that point, they had no sudden attack of morality. They did not suffer from pacifism. But they were afraid of a German defeat. Had war being avoided, we would have had to say that there was a denial of human rights to German Jews, and that was it. It was bad enough, but it didn't lead to genocide, it did not lead to the Holocaust. There is no necessary connection between human, denial of human rights and mass murder, mass violence, genocide, and so on. This is a total misperception. Are human rights, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, preservation of human rights, is this part of what we should do? Yes, but it's the other way around. You start with Holocaust and genocide. And the conclusion from that is that when you have a preservation of human rights and democracy, that the likelihood of mass violence, genocidal events, and so on, diminishes greatly. There are very few cases, to put it exactly, 3.5% in the last 100 years, that democracies engage in anything like mass human you know, violence and so on. 
and all the other percentage, what, 96.5% were non-democratic states, non-democratic organizations. So the preservation of human rights, the emphasis on human rights, the emphasis on democracy, that's crucial, that's vital, that's vital is the result of your teaching the Holocaust, not the beginning, but the, the outcome. How should one deal with that? How should one deal with a concept of tolerance? The Cockney expression would be, there ain't no such thing. Because tolerance means that you tolerate somebody you dislike intensely, but you will tolerate her or him because, well, you will tolerate. Understanding, identification, sympathy, that's something quite different. There is a museum that's going to be built in Jerusalem about tolerance. I shudder to think what they will show. Now, you don't have to deal as teachers with the arguments between the various schools of thought regarding history and so on and so forth. If you are interested in it, why not? Read it. But uh, in the last 30 years, according to one statistic, 47,000 books and major articles were written about the Holocaust. There is no human being that can have read all that, nor should they. So, summaries, textbooks, but the people who write the textbooks have to get it right. That's their responsibility. Once they have done that, you can use that and add and have video clips. Utilize modern technology, technology. Utilize long distance teaching. Utilize Facebook. Utilize Google. Utilize all these things. Check it out very carefully so you won't be misled. But we live in the 21st century, no longer by candlelight in the 19th. We've got to use the things that we have in our hands and don't be, not be afraid of that. When you deal with this, in my view, Yad Vashem has a special responsibility. Not only because we are the representatives in education and in research and so on of the people who were victimized in the Holocaust. Not only because of that but because I think we have the people who can do these things. We should provide our colleagues everywhere with short summaries of certain information that we can put together and supply to the teachers so that they can adapt these things to local conditions, languages, area, social strata, what not. We have to emphasize the universality of the Holocaust. One of the major points in the universality, the universal elements in the Holocaust, is the Jewish specificity of the Holocaust. Because every genocide is specific to a certain victim group. And because every genocide or every genocidal massacre is specific to a certain victim group. So the specificity is the universal character of all genocide, including the Holocaust. Those are two sides of the same coin. If you want to deal with the Holocaust, you must know something about the Jews. If you want to deal with Rwanda, you've got to know something about the Tutsi and the Hutu and the Twa. If you want to deal with Darfur, 
you have to deal with the Fur, the Masalit, the Zarawa, the Tanjur, the other groups there. If you want to deal with Somalia, with Congo, if you want to deal with the American Indians in the 19th century, you have to do some, know something about the March of Tears. You've got to know something about the Ogla Lassu, the Pierre's Nez. You've got to know something. You are not expected to know everything. So there has to be somebody who can supply you with some basic information. And then we, you will find out that there indeed are parallels between the Holocaust and other genocides. Very important parallels because the Holocaust was a genocide. And that there are unprecedented differences. That means that the Holocaust was a precedent. That means that it was not unique. That means that we have to teach the variety of it. I started off this section of my talk by saying that there is no education without stories. But if you limit yourself to stories, that's the wrong approach. You've got to do the other thing as well. Analysis, fit it, adjust it to your pupils. Don't overdo it. There is something called Holocaust fatigue. Much of it is invented, but some of it is quite correct. You've got to concentrate your message, not disperse it. It'll be much more effective. And let the pupils do much of the work. Mix information and stories. And then do what Hillel the Old did some 200 years before the Christian era. He had some sense of humor because when a non-Jew came to him and said, give me the whole of the Jewish teaching standing on one leg, he said very famously, don't do to others what you would, have, would not have done to yourself. But then he added something, you know. He said, now go and learn. Thank you.